recording now. Um, so just re we're starting now, so I'm going to repeat what I just said, um, but regarding recording, just friendly reminder that I usually say your names when I address you in the questions, but I'm not going to here because I don't want to give away your confidentiality. So if you are feeling like I'm not saying your name for a mean reason, don't worry. It's not that. It just can't. Okay, so just going back to emphasis here, these have a relatively low percentage of body weight, but they receive a, they receive a disproportionately large percentage of cardiac output. So this is something that I expect you to be able to do on tests. Fortunately, the tests are open notes, so you should have no problem achieving this. Um, so make sure that you're keeping track of the order in which blood is traversing the kidney. So renal artery splits into segmental arteries. And segmental arteries are weird. So the kidneys are um, thought of as having segmental arteries, but not segmental veins. The segmental veins instead are clearly called interlobar veins, even though they have relatively the same, same drainage pattern as the uh, segmental arteries have a supply pattern, there's a little bit of an asymmetry. So there are segmental arteries, there are no segmental veins. Why? Because name reasons. Don't worry about it too much. So the interlobar arteries divide each renal lobe from its neighbor. So we've got a renal pyramid and then the cortex overlying it, that's the lobe. And interlobar arteries run between those. Arcuate arteries are called that because they make an arch shape at the top. And then radiating from the tops of the arcuate arteries are what are called cortical radiate arteries. They're also called interlobular arteries. Now, I know that's confusing because interlobular looks a lot like interlobar. Lobules in the kidney are features of the cortex. A lobule is a group of nephrons, which is what this is, that are supplied by the same interlobular artery. So that's why they have that, oh, excuse me, that's why they have that name. So then we have afferent arterioles, a nephron. I'll explain what these things mean momentarily. So if you're real confused, don't worry, all will become clear. Efferent arterioles, and then paratubular capillaries or the vasorecta. All of this stuff I will explain when we get to the actual nephron. It'll make a lot more sense when I explain to you what this weird little squiggle of tubes is. Interlobular veins are the equivalent of interlobular arteries. And then we have arcuate veins, interlobar veins, the renal vein, and finally back to the inferior vena cava. So that's the path of blood through the kidney. And as you can see, the intense blood supply and the branching uh, create a situation where lots of blood can be filtered very, very fast. So medical application. What should you do if you see protein in your urine? Should you freak out? Not necessarily. So distance runners and swimmers, um, and this is not only true of them, but it's just common among this group. Um, so if anybody in here is a triathlete, I'm talking to you. Um, so let's say you decide you're going to do an Ironman and you're like, I don't really need to train for this. I'm generally pretty fit. First of all, no, you fool. Um, that's dangerous. But secondly, you may experience uh, transient or temporary proteinuria or hematuria. Um, so you've actually probably experienced this at some point in your life without really noticing it. Um, one common manifestation of proteinuria, which is protein in your urine, is urine that is foamy. So if you've ever taken a pee and then looked at the toilet and been like, gosh, it looks like a lager beer. Why is there all that foam there? You probably had a little bit of proteinuria. Nothing to be freaked out about unless it persists. So prolonged strenuous exercise reduces perfusion to the kidney, and that produces renal hypoxia, which means that the, the glomerulus, which filters the blood, is not working as it should be, and stuff makes it into the urine that's not supposed to. So just to make this connection with something that you learned previously, 
why does strenuous and exercise reduce perfusion to the kidney? Exercise activates your sympathetic nervous system. The vasomotor center in your sympathetic nervous system and sympathetic innervation of your blood vessels dilates the blood vessels that supply your skeletal muscles, which obviously you're using a lot while you're performing activities like this, and it constricts blood supply to your abdominal and pelvic viscera, including the kidneys. So that's why you experience this drop in blood flow to the kidneys during intense exercise. If you combine that with rhabdomyolysis, which is another accident of exercise, um, you actually can end up with renal failure. So rhabdomyolysis is when your skeletal muscle cells begin to burst and lyse because you're overstressing them. And then myoglobin blocks your kidney tubules while the kidneys don't have enough blood. And then you go from being kind of pooped and having a bad time to renal failure really fast. So this is me getting on my soapbox saying, if you choose to participate in intense physical exercise events, please, 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 if for no one else than for me, train for it first. I don't want to hear about anybody dying from uh, rhabdomyolysis, at least not for my class in general anyway. Uh, Lizette, or excuse me, I said your name. Uh, I'll censor it out. So um, someone's asking, why do diabetics get proteinuria? Um, and they have a lot of other effects on the kidneys as well. Um, and the answer to that is it, with diabetics, um, especially if diabetic, and yeah, neither do I, person who just said that. I'm, I've, I've, I've fully entered slug mode. My brain is taking up too much of my calorie budget to, to exercise right now. Um, the reason for diabetics getting proteinuria is the the kidneys, thank you, um, the kidneys are working so hard to clear the extra glucose, um, which gives you glucosuria. So I'll, tra I'll, I'll talk about transport maximum a little bit later, but basically the kidneys get so overwhelmed with the need to process this one thing that other things fall by the wayside, and that includes a change in, in glomerular permeability. Okay, so I promised you I would explain what this weird wad of tubes was, and now I shall. So these may look small and inconsequential, but what you're looking at here is the business end of your kidney. So this is the series of tubes and their associated vessels that actually put in the work. So it's also an unconventional uh, piece of vasculature. So I taught you guys about capillary beds and we discussed things like continuous versus fenestrated capillary beds. Um, and also uh, things like, you know, portal systems and other weirdnesses. Here's another weird one. And the loop of Henle, yes. AKA nephron loop, AKA renal loop. That thing's got so many names. Why? So confusing. So blood is going to come in here through the arcuate artery, ascend, and then enter a glomerulus via an afferent arteriole, which is this thing that I'm tracing here. So if you're reading this and you're like, well, where does it say glomerulus? Renal corpuscle is what this is. So the renal corpuscle, if you look over here at this bracketed set of information, includes the glomerulus, but also a series of linings. So I'm not going to read this slide to you for a moment. I'm going to instead sort of back up and give you the broader picture of why this thing is shaped the way it is, because the way it's shaped is really what permits it to function the way it does. So the glomerulus, which is this very odd ball-shaped wad of capillaries, it is under constant pressure. And you can see, if you look carefully, it's arterioles at one end and at the other end. So it's not like a normal capillary bed where there's a difference in hydrostatic pressure between one and the other sides. So arterioles in general have about 35 millimeters of mercury of pressure. And you know, at the other end of the capillary bed, you have venules and those have only about 18. 
this thing is highly pressurized all the way through. So very little loss of pressure here. Because the glomerulus is pressurized, plasma or something very similar to it is constantly leaking out. So we'll look a little bit more closely at what this looks like in SEM, for example. But the Cliffs Notes version is that if you take a bunch of fluid and you force it through some pressurized tubes and those tubes have holes in them, fluid's going to leave. And that's what happens. So once that fluid leaves, it enters the proximal convoluted tubule. And proximal here refers to it's the proximal one relative to the renal corpuscle. Then it descends this weird loop. And notice the loop has some thick parts and some thin parts. That's significant. There's a reason for that, and I'll talk about it. So the loop is just this loop. It, deep, it dips either a little bit into the medulla of the kidney or a lot. And then it ascends to form this series of loops called the distal convoluted tubule. There's a special area of the distal convoluted tubule called the macula densa. And then from there, the distal convoluted tubule plugs into something called the collecting duct. So blood is filtered here. Filtrate, which is what we call it before it becomes urine, kind of percolates through these tubes, and it has things extracted from it and things added to it. And that's the process by which it is urine by the time it gets to the collecting duct. So the entire time that fluid is traveling, this little circuitous network of tubes, is when it's gradually becoming urine. Okay, the nephron. And here's a better picture of the renal corpuscle right there. So if you are lucky, and this particular slice is lucky for histology, if you're lucky, you'll be able to see both the vascular and the urinary pole of each renal corpuscle. So the vascular pole is, of course, what it sounds like. It's the pole of the corpuscle that has the blood on it, because that's where the blood vessels are, the vasculature. The tubular pole is the pole where the proximal tubule begins. So. If you look closely, you can see these little podocytes. Podocytes uh, are cells with feet. And then blood is going to flow through here. It's pressurized. Fluid leaks out between the little feetsies. Meanwhile, large things like albumins and fibrinogen and red blood cells, they stay in. So they're going to leave via the afferent arterial, or efferent, excuse me. And then the filtrate's going to proceed into the proximal convoluted tubule. So this actually answers the previous question a little bit more. Uh, not in any greater detail than I said, but the basic idea, um, and this includes not only diabetes, but glomerulonephritis. The basic idea is if you change the permeability of this thing due to, for example, strain on the kidneys from trying to process glucose, over time, the glomerulus becomes more permeable to proteins. And the proteins build up in the filtrate, and there's no mechanism really in the kidney tubule to reclaim proteins. There's plenty of mechanisms to reclaim you know, acids, but not whole proteins. So proteinuria is what results. Proteinuria is an indicator of lots of different disorders, so it's not good enough as a medical cue by itself. If you saw this in a patient's urine, you would need to collect other information to confidently say what exactly was going on with them. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in on this picture in a moment because this is perhaps one of my favorite scanning electron micrographs of all time. So the renal corpuscle consists of the glomerulus, and it's surrounded by like a little ping pong ball ball of cells. So the parietal layer is what we call this. And we call this the parietal layer of the Bowman's capsule. Um, 
So Bowman is the guy who discovered this and parietal layer, like any other parietal layer, just means it's the layer that's away from the organ, not lining it directly. So parietal layer is here. Here we have the glomerulus. If you look closely, you can even see a little erythrocytes in here. You can also see other cells and these are the podocyte nuclei and then they wrap around the capillaries. So the pedicels are the little processes, as you can see here. So these are gonna cover over the glomerular capillaries, but the glomerular capillaries themselves, these are fenestrated capillaries. So remember, fenestrated means windowed. Therefore, fenestrated capillaries are capillaries with windows. So they have big holes in them so stuff can get out. But you don't want cells and large proteins leaking through there, so you have this little, basically a cellular sieve or colander that prevents large particles from leaving. So now I'm gonna zoom in on this cool bit. Or not, my computer's frozen. Can I, can I access my zoom in thing? It doesn't wanna let me. There we go, okay, now I can. So how cool is that? Here's a podocyte, this is where its nucleus is housed. And then it has this tremendous assortment of little tiny pedicels, AKA fake leggies. And these little leggies interlock with each other to prevent large things from flowing out. So this is really effective at permitting the glomerulus to filter the blood without allowing large useful substances out. All right, so if you look at this picture up here, this refers to the uh, abbreviations here. So glomerulus is the whole thing. So this, this, sorry, mouse is not cooperating. This wad of capillaries, the corpuscle is the whole thing, including the wad of capillaries and the space it sits in. The capsular space is just the distance between the glomerulus and the parietal layer of the capsule. And then we've got the macula densa. So if you look, well, let's get my magnifying glass again. So macula densa is Latin for dense spot. Macula means spot, densa means dense. So macula densa is a group of cells at, right at the juncture between the distal tubule and collecting duct. So some, some sources will say that the macula densa is on the distal tubule. Other sources will say that the macula densa is on the collecting duct. So it varies. It's right at the juncture. But regardless, these are cells that are packed together more densely than their neighbors. That's why they're named that. And these are cells that help to sense renal blood flow. So they're, they're dense and they're different looking in appearance because they have a different job. Okay, so how does this filtration work anyway? When blood plasma is forced under pressure to leave the capillary, it does so through the fenestrations. So this little sort of green blob guy here uh, is basically just telling you what you can find in filtrate. So notice, I'm saying filtrate, I'm not saying urine yet. That's because filtrate should be different than urine. There is no quality control mechanism here. There's no place at which, you know, uh, protons are reclaimed to keep the body at an appropriate pH or glucose is reclaimed. So this is just bulk fluid movement. So this is what comes out. It's not the same as urine, but it will eventually be urine. And then the glomerular filtration barrier, this is just the, the capillary endothelium plus the basement membrane and the filtration slits in there. Okay, so more consequences of the kidney on, or excuse me, of diabetes on the kidney. So glomerulosclerosis, sclerosis is a hardening and thickening and function loss. 
Glomerulosclerosis is, of course, that phenomenon, thickening and loss of function in the glomerulus. And it's specifically a hypertrophy, or not hypertrophy, excuse me, uh, basically an overgrowth of the basement membrane of the glomerulus. So it makes the diffusion or the pressure difference really, really high. And this is not limited to the kidneys and diabetes. It just has specific effects when it is in the kidneys. So you get microvascular sclerosis in the kidneys, which is what's causing um, poor blood supply to the feet and diabetic foot ulcers, to name a few. So this is another thing that would require hemodialysis. And it's just because the, the basement membrane has to be thin enough for water and other stuff to make it through. If it's too thick, the kidneys won't function properly. Alrighty. So let's look at this word before we break down what this does. Mies means middle or between and angial means blood vessels. So this word is new for most of you, but it has a meaning. So mesangial means between blood vessels, specifically between the afferent and efferent arterioles and between the capillaries and the glomerulus. So if you look at this little cross section here, we've got capillary, 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 capillary. They are still surrounded by podocytes, but joining two of the capillaries is a mesangial cell. So these are not covered by podocyte surfaces in their entirety. And mesangial cells have the power to, for example, wrap around capillaries and change the blood flow through the glomerulus, among other things. Okay, so the renal tubule. These are the series of tubes. And by the way, all of those tubes primarily are simple cuboidal epithelium. So when I start to teach my students simple cuboidal epithelium in the early stages of anatomy and physiology, I warn them, hey, this is training wheel stuff. So I expect you to recognize simple cuboidal epithelium, but later I'm gonna show you two instances of cuboidal epithelium that look different and you're gonna to have to tell me which is which. So it gets harder. This is where it gets harder. So the proximal convoluted tubule is most coiled which means that in cross-section in a kidney slide, you see a greater variety of cross-sectional shapes. So it's a simple cuboidal epithelium with really prominent microvilli. And you can actually see that the lumen looks kind of hairy almost in these guys. Um, so you can't see a distinct or clear edge to the lumen. It's kind of just messy in there. And the purpose of those microvilli is really the same as the purpose of the microvilli in the small intestine, and that is to produce an increase in surface area for absorption. But in this case, we're not absorbing nutrients from food. We're taking stuff back from the filtrate that we need. So, for example, maybe there's like amino acids and some fatty acids and some other stuff in my filtrate, and my body's like, yo, I need to make proteins. I can't afford to just be peeing out amino acids willy-nilly. That's wasteful. So my kidneys are in charge of gathering back useful objects from the filtrate. I bet you never knew the process of making pee was so involved, but it is. So the nephron loop, or loop of Henle, um, is this weird U-shaped thing. And it has a general function and its general function is extract salt from the filtrate and then use that salt to attract water. That's what the thick segments and thin segments are for. So the thick segments look thick because they're a thicker epithelium. The thin segments, this is a small place where there is um, squamous epithelium instead of cuboidal and that's what the thin segment is. 
So the thin segments are permeable to water, the thick segments are for transport of salts. Now, I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to sit here and think about it and try to answer it. I'm also going to remind you that it's okay to be wrong because you're just learning. So if you happen to be incorrect about the question I'm about to ask you, not a reason to feel embarrassed. You're here to learn, not because you already know. So if I'm transporting salts using a pump, why would I have lots of mitochondria in this thick segment area? Are the pumps ATP uh, driven? They are indeed. So it would stand to reason that you would need mitochondria to produce that ATP, right? Very good. Yeah, so where you have ATP need, you must put ATP factories. So I'll explain a little bit about how this works. It's really, really cool. Um, but I wanna move on first. So when we get to the distal convoluted tubule, um, which is the end of the nephron. So the nephron includes the corpuscle, the proximal tubule, our friend the loop, and then the distal tubule. So the, the collecting duct is not considered to be part of a nephron. Rather, it gathers urine from multiple nephrons. So this is also yet, yet another flavor of simple cuboidal epithelium. What a joy. How are you supposed to tell between and among all of them? Um, and this is a urine transporter. I also like that the renal tubule is also called the uriniferous tubule. Um, this is a kind of older term. It's a little bit dated. It's still used somewhere though, some places though. It's just funny because like, I don't know, uriniferous is a more hilarious word than um, renal. Uh, good question. So it sounds like uh, the question, by the way, for YouTube friends is where does the ferrous come from regarding the suffix? Uh, if you were to just hear it, it's a homophone with F-E-R-R-O-U-S, which refers to iron, um, but it doesn't have the same origin. So it's just a suffix. Uh, wh when you have um, anything that makes something. It's called the blah blah iferous tubule. Um, so it's just like, for example, seminiferous tubule makes sperm, uriniferous tubule makes urine. I don't actually know the specific etymology for the suffix ferris, though. I believe it is Latin, but don't quote me on that. Um, although I've become pretty good at Latin and Greek, I am by no means a Latin scholar yet. So uh, I don't fully know is the answer to that question. I just know that it is not related to iron, even though it sounds like it. Oh, I'm seeing you say, oh, do you know? If you do, please share. I like learning. In the meantime, uh, I'm gonna draw you out the way that the loop of Henley works because I think that it deserves to be appreciated because, um, it's just elegant. Uh, so as far as simple solutions to complicated problems, uh, evolution is sometimes very bad at that. <laughs> it's sometimes very good. So um, on the bad end, we've got runaway sexual selection where we've got fancy solutions to simple problems like need to mate, grow a big weird tail. But on the simple side of solutions, we've got the loop of Henley, which is really effective at doing one thing and it does it simply. So for that, I'm gonna, can I open my Apple launcher from here? No, I can't, okay, fine. Oh, wait, I can, yay, there it is. So I'm gonna grab Epic Pen and do some board work real quick. Oh, that makes sense. So bearing and producing is what Iphorus or Eris means, which is totally logical now that I think of it. So thank you for looking that up, I appreciate it. And I learned a new thing today because of you. See, you guys, this is why you should ask questions, even if you're not 100% confident, because sometimes I don't know, and then I get to learn something, and I get slightly smarter because of you. Okay. So I'm taking my computer off of its little cradle, and I'm going to do some writing. 
I'm really, really hoping against hope that it does not result in a necro cube. So we'll see. Oh, I have to put on my dumb hand panty. Hold on. Okay, so I'm very excited about this thing. I hope that once uh, I finish doing it, you understand why. Also, um, I have lost the ability to see the chat temporarily because the Blackboard portion of this is covering the view of it in the other screen. So if you have a question about what I'm uh, writing, feel free to ask it. I just won't answer it until I change the screen again. Okay, so since we're talking about P, we might as well make this text yellow. All right, so I'm going to draw just a really rudimentary uh, kidney lobule. Let's, I don't know, magenta, because reasons. And I'm going to pretend we live in a magical world where there's one nephron loop per renal medulla. Obviously, that's completely false, but it makes it easier for me to draw things. So humor me. Thank you. All right, so let's see, I got na, 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 arcuate artery, cortical radiates, afferent, blah, efferent. And then I'm gonna draw my tubule. So I'm making this really long for two reasons, and I'll explain once I finish drawing it. So over here we have our collecting duct. Um, so I'm gonna leave the paratubular capillaries for later once I, I finish with this thing. Okay. So over here, and actually I think I'm gonna erase my collecting duct because I want some space to label. So, uh, oops. So I mentioned the word juxtamedullary. I'll write that down for you too, so you know what I'm talking about. So this is a juxtamedullary nephron. And that means it's one of the few nephrons of the total population of them whose loop of Henle deeps, uh, dips very, very deep into the renal medulla. And here's one of the reasons for that. So um, if you're watching either alive or at home, dial your brains back to thinking about osmolarity and osmosis and water movement for a moment. I know it's a rudimentary part of biology, but it matters a lot here if you understand that. So one thing to note, and I'm gonna pick green for my osmolarity stuff. So uh, the filtrate that comes out of the urinary pole is about 300 milliosmoles in osmolarity. So down here at the bottom of the renal medulla, the osmolarity is much, much higher. So what you have is an osmolarity gradient in the medulla from relatively low osmolarity to very high osmolarity. So what we say in, you know, lazy biologist talk is, when we talk about osmolarity, we say saltiness, which is, is reductive. It's not only salt, it's other stuff too, but there's a gradient. So less to more. 
as you descend in the renal medulla. Maintenance of that gradient is really important. The only reason you can concentrate your urine is that. So here's how this works. And I also, please note, I haven't illustrated parts of the loop as being thick or thin, again, because I'm lazy and I want room to draw things. So over here, in thick tubule mitochondria rich ATP land, we actually have sodium chloride transporters. So usually we've got sodium potassium exchange pumps, but here we have pumps that are using ATP to transport, I guess I'll choose this color. So you get the idea. These pumps on the ascending loop, the thick portion of it, um, these are pumping sodium chloride, so the functional equivalent of table salt, out of the renal tubule. And this is at the expense of ATP, which is why all those mitochondria are there. So why would you want to pump salt out? Well, Salts, including sodium chloride, attract water. So this area, uh, you. is very permeable to sodium chloride due to the presence of those pumps. It's not at all permeable to water. So if water wanted to get in or out there, it couldn't. By contrast, this area is not permeable to salt, but it's very permeable to water. So we have some different driving forces on each leg of the loop, but also notice the distance between is small. So the descending loop and the ascending loop are right next to each other, even though they have different permeabilities. So what this means is if we have filtrate, and I'm going to use little blue dots as being water. And I'm going to use little green dots as being sodium chloride. So the filtrate coming down the tube in the thin loop has both. But in the beginning, it has a lot of water. And then the water dissipates because if I have pumps over here, pumping sodium chloride out, that means the further down I go in the medulla, the saltier the external environment to the tube will be. So in this leg of the tube, because of the salty surroundings, water is leaving.
so that means just as there's an osmolarity difference in the medulla, the filtrate that enters the loop is about 300 milliosmoles. But by the time you get down to the bottom of the loop, because water's been actively leaving, it's about 1,200. <laughs> bulk fluid flow, it doesn't ever reach equilibrium, it just keeps going because more filtrate is arriving and displacing the old filtrate. So another part of this magic is relying on bulk flow of fluids. So now we have this really low water, really high salt filtrate at the bottom here. being transferred and now it's going into an area that's not so it's not that there's no water down here it's just that there's not very much now it's going up a tube that is permeable to sodium chloride but not to water so by the time you get to the distal convoluted tubule on average you get Filtrate that before it entered the loop was about 300 milliosmoles. Now it's only about 100. And you've effectively taken back both salt and water from the filtrate that you produced. So the volume of filtrate is lower, its osmolarity is lower, and you've gotten all that precious, precious water back. Now, where does the water go? Well, one thing I didn't draw was that this whole tube is covered over with something called the vasa recta, which is a ladder-shaped capillary bed. So all of that water, and let me draw this. Enters the vasa recta. So just by having two tubes with opposing flow, so water going down on the left and up on the right, and having those two tubes have different permeabilities, you create a counter current exchange system that is extremely efficient. If your kidneys didn't have this capability, we would just have all kinds of water balance problems that would be life threatening. So I'm gonna take a screenshot of this really quick, um, just so that my histology students can uh, look at it later. For those of you who actually bothered to attend lecture, this will probably make a lot of sense. For people who chose not to, um, it's probably going to look like a carnival of confusion, but that's the benefit of showing up. Okay, so thank you for permitting me to be on my soapbox about um, how cool the loop of Henley is. I think it's pretty clear that I'm a giant nerd about it. I'm grateful for mine because it means I don't die of dehydration. I don't know about you. Oh no, why did it do that? Uh, welcome to how many videos I've produced in the last few weeks. This is only one place I store them. I don't know why that's showing up there. Bye. Okay. Um, oh, so good question. Somebody's asking in the chat, what does it do with all the salt? So the salt actually stays in the renal medulla for the most part. Um, some of it en ends up re-entering or being transported elsewhere in the blood, but a lot of it just sticks around. Um, so you have this like slow replacement of old salt as it dissociates and enters the bloodstream. Um, so sodium obviously is a useful ion because of course action potentials rely on it, right? So you can't have excitable cells without extracellular sodium. And then chloride is useful because there's this important reaction called the chloride shift that's involved in picking up and dropping off oxygen uh, between the blood and the tissues and the blood and the gas. So um, the answer to the salt specifically is it gets split up into its component ions and then repurposed uh, according to the chemistry of the interstitial fluid. But a lot of it sticks around and helps to maintain that weird osmolarity gradient. Okay, so we've been uh, actively on here for about an hour. Again, sorry for the delay. I had to post bail for my activist friend and get them out of jail. 
Um, so this seems like a good time to take a short bathroom break and we'll reconvene in about three minutes because I know it's already 720 um, to try and make some more headway in this. But I know I have to use the facilities and I imagine some people might want to re-up on beverages or whatnot. So um, we'll do that. So I'll see you in three minutes. Okie doke, I'm back. So, yeah. Let me just really quick lose the ability to operate the computer entirely, and I'll be with you in just a moment. Okay, well, let's see here. Just checking, um, I have a fan on me because my office is upstairs and it's really hot. Uh, can you guys hear the fan? I'll turn it off if it's bothering you. Okay, great, thank you. I just wanted to make sure because like I'm I'm walking this fine line between absolutely roasting but also worrying about ambient noise because we've already had so many problems with that. So I'm trying to split the difference as best I can. Okay, so uh, this problem that I'm showing you here and you might be wondering what problem? The problem is this is simple cuboidal epithelium. <laughs> so is this. So is that, so is that, and so is this. So you guys see how different those all look? That tends to throw students for a loop considerably. 
So uh, with regard to that, here's how you tell. So uh, I got some feedback from students that I think is helpful. And that is that even though you guys have dedicated lab Zoom sessions, you're also finding it helpful when I point out stuff that will help you in uh, lab identification of things, or at least reinforce that. So I'm going to try and uh, be fastidious in the time we have left about doing so. So one thing you're going to notice about the proximal convoluted tubules, which are these ones here, is that the cytoplasm of the cells is relatively uniform. It's pretty acidophilic as well, so it looks nice and pink. And because of that brush border, the lumen is messy looking. So you have very little clear space. And even if you did, you would see sort of a fuzziness here. So even though it's simple cuboidal epithelium and so is distal convoluted tubule, the, the morphology of the cuboidal cells causes a difference in tissue appearance. So that's kind of the deal there. This is like the holy grail of uh, kidney histology images, by the way. Let me grab it. Okay. So you have to get super lucky to actually capture the urinary pole and specifically the space where the Bowman's capsule empties into the urinary pole. But here we have, so you can see, see this fuzzy stuff that persists in the proximal convoluted tubule? This is the filtrate. So it's got a combo of things in here that are picking up stain and that creates this appearance. And you can actually see the little stream of filtrate trickling out of the glomerulus and entering this tubule. That's super nifty. Granted, I'm a huge dork and I think stuff like that is cool, but the fact that you can see it with a really simple stain, like a hematoxyl and a niacin stain, is pretty amazing. Okay, so over here in distal convoluted tubule territory, we can see that the DCTs, because they don't need the same brush border to perform tubular reabsorption, uh, they look much more classically simple cuboidal. So nice uniform apical surface, uh, square cells with round central nuclei, they fit all the hallmarks of classical simple cuboidal epithelium. The paratubular capillaries are these little guys right here, and here, and here. So paratubular capillaries are capillaries that wrap around the distal and proximal tubules, and they arise from the efferent arter arteriole of the glomerulus. So although the glomerulus is red all the way through, as you clearly saw, and it's not participating in a gas exchange, the gas exchange does occur across the paratubular capillaries. So if you look at illustrations from your book of them, you'll see that they transition from red to blue as oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. All right, so RC equals renal corpuscle, so that's the glomerulus plus the capsule. And as you can see in this picture, even though the stain's not especially like groundbreaking looking, the DCT's lumens still appear a lot more clear than the PCT, which are all these fuzzy guys. And the proximal convoluted tubule cells have a more eosinophilic cytoplasm than the distal. So over here, this is a cross section of the medulla. Again, we have simple cuboidal epithelium. Surprise! Um, the DCTs do also tend to be smaller, to answer Lizette's question, yes, but uh, not universally so. So its size alone is not a good way to tell the difference. You need to use size and apical surface morphology and cell color all together to really be sure. Um, that's a great question. Thank you. I'm glad you asked it. So my, my typical advice if you're trying to distinguish between two things in histology that are really similar is make sure that you're versed in more than one visual cue so that if one is confusing to you, you can rely on another one. So down here, we've got thin sections of loops of Henle, which look like that. And then also thick ascending limbs, which are simple cuboidal. 
And the collecting ducts, so the collecting ducts actually start out cuboidal, but the cells become increasingly columnar as you approach the papillary duct, the papillary duct being the duct at the tip of the renal papilla. Um, so because there's a continuum of cell height, there's not like one spot where the cells are suddenly columnar, the collecting ducts can be really confusing. So um, as you can see, for example, let me get my magnifying glass here. Um, there we go. See this little guy right here, um, this collecting duct, you can see the cells are more columnar, but this little, this little dude down in the bottom left or bottom right corner, excuse me, um, these cells look a lot more cuboidal. So if you're just looking for shape, you're not going to have an easy time differentiating between this and this. However, if you take into account shape, but also eosinophility, which is a word I just made up, I, I mean degree of eosinophilic, but I'm not sure if eosinophility is a word. Uh, you get what I mean though, right? So um, degree of eosinophilicness. So this is a lot, obviously a lot pinker than that. So color plus shape is your best bet. Okay. So let's walk through your information from front to back. I showed you in depth the processes happening at the nephron loop. And now we're gonna talk about other stuff. Now, not in as much detail as you might get in anatomy and physiology, but pretty decent. So filtration is when fluid forms in the cap capsular space, and that's because Look at the diameter of the afferent arterial compared with the efferent. Do you guys see that? Big entrance, small exit. What that means is there, there is constant high pressure in here, which means that fluid leaks out of those fenestrations. So tubular reabsorption is when stuff that's useful, like amino acids, like fatty acids, like glucose, et cetera, returns to the blood. So here we have the paratubular capillaries. Tubular secretion is when more waste from the paratubular capillaries is added to the filtrate. So maybe some urea filtered out here, but you're like, well, I have more in here left over, so I'm gonna stick some more urea in here. Or maybe there's like metabolites of drug wastes, pharmaceuticals, for example. Those are heavily excreted in the urine, um, and so maybe those enter here as well. Then we get into the loop of Henle where water is leaving on the descending limb in the thin area um, and that's where the the drawing I just made for you comes into play. So I mentioned the macula densa. The macula densa is part of a structure called the juxtaglomerular. Uh, which diagram? This one back here? Um, so I know your text is overseen by McGraw-Hill, which is what this is, but it looks like it might come from an anatomy and physiology textbook um, if it's not in yours. I don't have the, I don't have your text to hand right now. So, um, however, I do release the PowerPoints with the image files not embedded. So if you want to just right click it and save it, you're welcome to do that. It's totally fine. Good question. So I mentioned the word juxtaglomerular nephron earlier. I also want to stress juxtaglomerular apparatus. So juxtaglomerular apparatus is a group of cells, including macula densa and mesangial cells, that do a couple things. One of those is regulate the relative diameter of the afferent and efferent arterial. And they do that by sensing flow, so bulk fluid flow past a certain point and or fluid composition. And they accomplish this via paracrine signaling. So the macula densa cells detect things, specifically salt and oxygen, in the DCT. And then as a result of that, they tell the mesangial cells how to behave. 
so the JG cells or juxtaglomerular cells, notice that they're present over here in the afferent arterial, but not over here in the efferent. These are modified smooth muscle cells. So when they're stimulated by the macula densa, um, they're gonna secrete renin in response to a drop in blood pressure. And then renin activates the renin angiotensin system. Uh, the renin angiotensin system is also called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system because aldosterone, uh, which is a renal, or excuse me, an adrenal cortex hormone is also involved. Um, but this is basically going to say, hey, the kidneys are experiencing a drop in blood flow. And since they experience 21% of cardiac output, that probably means that everybody else's blood flow is not great also. So we need to rapidly increase the pressure. So here's how this works. Renin comes from the kidney, hence the prefix ren. Angiotensinogen, which is a precursor hormone, is converted to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. And this is actually the process that's computed in the lungs. So angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So angiotensinogen is produced by the liver. Angiotensin 1 is converted from this form in the blood. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs. And then angiotensin 2 is a potent, potent vasoconstrictor, and it initiates the secretion of antidiuretic hormone from the uh, posterior pituitary and aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So this causes the hypothalamus to make you thirsty. It also stimulates the production of less urine that is higher osmolarity, and those things together hopefully help you conserve enough water to bring blood pressure back up. So here's what this looks like. So here we have the afferent arterial, and here we have the efferent. And if you look very, very closely, here's the macula densa right here, and this is the distal convoluted tubule that's associated. And you can also see the juxtal glomerular cells. And if you look closely, these kind of darker purpley ones are the mesangial cells. So they give way to the mesangial cells that are amongst the glomerular capillaries. So this is what this looks like if you zoom in on what is called, again, the vascular pole of a given renal corpuscle. Now, this is a lucky slice. You don't get this in every single slice of the kidney, but if you look around enough on an individual kidney, odds are you'll get one. Okay, so here we have, again, region, histological features, location, and function. So a good starting place for um, sort of studying stuff. Uh, Lizette's asking, if you had Addison's disease, would you get less thirsty since you don't produce much hormones of the adrenal gland? Um, not necessarily, uh, although there is some salt dysregulation changes that do happen. Uh, the primary driver of thirst is ADH and the uh, hypothalamus, actually. So the hypothalamus produces ADH, the posterior pituitary just releases it. Um, so thirst is really mostly computed upstairs in the central nervous system. Um, it has consequences for the periphery, to be sure, including the adrenal gland, but it's, it's mostly computed by the CNS because water is so essential to life. Great question, but very intuitive. Okay, uh, so that is now. Oh, do you have a salt this one actually with Edison's disease? Oh no, necrocute. Well, according to my clock, it is time to be done. So how about, <laughs> necrocube is like the bell tolling for the end of lecture in this case, how funny. Um, so Lizette, your question about uh, the salt dysregulation is a really good one. Um, that's primarily related to aldosterone, um, 
because it acts on sodium potassium pumps, but the actual explanation is a little bit more long-winded. So I'm going to have to wait until I have a chance to like type it out for you. So stay tuned, but I will answer it. Um, so thank you for your patience today. I appreciate you waiting for me. I'm sorry. That wasn't my intention. I had to do something that was very politically important to me. So um, your, your patience and participation mean a lot to me. And as always... Thank you for your attention this evening, and I will talk to you in the next lecture. Um, also, someone pointed out that they had completed uh, one of the shorter versions of the exams and uh, that it wasn't showing them their grade yet. And I, I realized that since I denied them the ability to see the answers right away, it had also prevented them from seeing what they got. So I'm going to go change that right now. It'll change pretty quick. I will. Thank you. And then also, uh, L, what would you like to know? You had a question. And I've lost control of my mouse. Wonderful. Um, I'm having an issue with it working. So if I can't get it to work the way it's supposed to, I'll just go ahead and wave it. But if not, it's going to obey the same principle as the uh, little bite-sized exams, which is once I manage to get it open and running, it will just exist available to take until the very end of the term. So you'll have plenty of flexibility in when you choose to do it. All right, y'all. Um, so I will be in touch. Thank you as always. I appreciate you and I will talk to you very soon. And oh, I will say hello to the floos and the snakes. Quick note before we end. Um, I got a new snake. His name is Gucci Mane the snake and I will post a picture of him on Slack later. He's very pretty. He also bites, so we'll see. <laughs> All right, guys, have an awesome night. Um, if you choose to go demonstrate, please be safe. Uh, please keep me posted. Make sure that you're protecting yourself, specifically your eyes and your respiratory tracts. Your health matters to me. Bye, have a good night. <laughs>